Good day everyone. We are Group 5 and we will be presenting an article of Kotsukali and Valas titled Anaerobic and Aerobic Respiration in Yeast, Small-Scale Variations on a Classical Laboratory Activity. Organisms primarily derive energy from the oxidation of carbohydrate, fat, and protein sources via a process known as cellular respiration. It allows the release of free energy from the substrate, which is stored in adenosine triphosphate or ATP, in a controlled manner through a series of enzyme-catalyzed metabolic reactions. Cellular respiration is generally divided into two types, namely aerobic and anaerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration occurs in conditions with abundant oxygen and utilizes oxygen as the final electron acceptor. On the other hand, anaerobic respiration consists of reactions which are independent of the presence of molecular oxygen, under which is fermentation. Both aerobic and anaerobic steps can be utilized by a single cell. As an example, in eukaryotes, glucose undergoes a 10-step anaerobic process which converts the glucose to two pyruvate molecules. This multi-step process is collectively known as glycolysis. In the presence of oxygen, pyruvate is routed to the tricarboxylic acid cycle or Krebs cycle. Following Krebs cycle, electron transport chain and chemosmosis proceed as the major source of ATP in various organisms and to regenerate oxidizing agents consumed in previous steps. On the other hand, pyruvate is converted into lactate or ethanol in the process of fermentation when oxygen is unavailable. Saccharomyces cerevisiae is commonly referred to as baker's or brewer's yeast due to its application in baking and winemaking, and is the most common species of its genus. It has long been used as a model organism since it exhibits remarkable similarities with eukaryotic metabolic and cellular pathways and its low cost. Yeast is a facultative anaerobe, meaning that it is capable of aerobic and anaerobic respiration. However, in most cases, it is considered to be committed to fermentative metabolism. The objective of this experiment is to compare the aerobic and anaerobic pathways of carbohydrate metabolism in S. cerevisiae. It will specifically investigate the stoichiometric relations and kinetics in the yeast metabolism. The next section describes the setups and materials that were needed in order to perform the experiment. The reactor component for both aerobic and anaerobic testing conditions was made of the yeast culture Saccharomyces boulardii, a strain of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, suspended in 50 ml Erlenmeyer flasks. Each flask contained 500 mg of the yeast mixed with 25 ml of distilled water. Four of these reaction chambers were prepared in total. For each of the two testing conditions, one served as a control while another served as a test sample with 1.5 grams of D-glucose used to activate reactions. In order to investigate the rate and extent of the yeast's aerobic and anaerobic reactions, weighing and volumetric measuring devices were used respectively. For aerobic respiration, the mass decrease of each reaction chamber due to gas production was measured at defined intervals using an analytical four decimal point balance. The control group served to distinguish mass changes due to the production of carbon dioxide from those that are due to the evaporation of water. For anaerobic respiration, two sets of gasometer apparatus was used to measure the water displacement due to gas production from the control and the test sample reaction chambers. In this setup, a 25 ml glass graduated cylinder filled with water was inverted and immersed right below the water level line of a 600 ml glass beaker also filled with water. The cylinder, 
which had a small air bubble formation on top, was fixed in place by a clamp stand. A 30 cm segment of a 10 mm plastic tubing had one end exposed to the air chamber of the inverted cylinder, while the other end was inserted to the hole of a rubber stopper placed over a reaction chamber. This tubing was clamped with a siphon hose plastic shut-off clamp to ensure that a minimum volume of water passed through the tubing. Other materials that were needed for this experiment include a stopwatch for keeping time measurements, a thermometer to establish temperature conditions, and a barometer to establish pressure conditions. The anaerobic reaction with the yeast was further investigated by testing the presence of ethanol using the triiodomethane test. For this test, the following materials were used. 8 ml of the reacted culture material, 3% iodine solution, 1 molar of sodium hydroxide, a 1 ml plastic pipette, a 10 ml syringe, a 0.45 micrometer syringe filter, and a 15 milliliter beaker. Now we move on to the standard procedure. The first step was to prepare the setups, having an experimental group and a control group each for aerobic and anaerobic respiration. Next, 1.5 grams of glucose were added to the experimental groups. After adding the glucose, the flasks were gently swirled for 30 seconds. After which, the mass reduction was recorded for the aerobic reaction flasks every 5 minutes for 50 minutes. Before each measurement, the flasks were swirled for 3 to 4 seconds to release the dissolved gas. At the same interval of every 5 minutes for 50 minutes, the volumetric measurements were recorded for the anaerobic reaction flasks. Again, the flasks were swirled for 3 to 4 seconds before each measurement. To process the data, control measurements were subtracted from the testing measurements and the quantities were converted to millimole of carbon dioxide. After the gas measurements have been completed, we can test for the presence of ethanol using the triiodomethane test. Using a 10 ml syringe, 8 ml of material from the cultures were transferred and expelled through a 0.45 micrometer syringe filter into respective beakers. Using a 1 ml plastic disposable pipette, Two drops of 3% iodine solution were introduced into each beaker to oxidize any ethanol present. Lastly, 3 to 4 drops of 1 molar sodium hydroxide was added to decolorize the resulting solutions, and the presence or absence of precipitate was recorded. Let's move on to the results and discussion. Let's just go over aerobic respiration quickly. Aerobic respiration entails using oxygen gas in the utilization of glucose for energy. This involves glycolysis, an intermediate step, the Krebs cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. The first occurs in the cytosol, and the rest in the mitochondria. In glycolysis, glucose is oxidized into two pyruvate molecules. This produces ATP. This also converts NAD plus to NADH nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide hydrogen. In an intermediate step, pyruvate is converted into acetyl coenzyme A. This involves the use of NAD plus and the production of CO2 gas. In the Krebs cycle, acetyl CoA is oxidized, extracting high energy electrons that shall be held by NADH and FADH2, flavine adenine dinucleotide hydrogen. In oxidative phosphorylation, the electron transport chain, which consists of membrane protein complexes, extracts the electrons from NADH and FADH2 and drives ATP production. As electrons are passed down the chain, protons are pumped from their matrix into the intermembrane space. The large proton gradient created then drives ATP production by ATP synthase. Ultimately, Oxygen accepts the electrons from the fourth complex and gets reduced to water. Altogether, the complete oxidation of glucose is as follows. 1 glucose plus 6 oxygen into 6 carbon dioxide plus 6 water and 30 to 30 to ATP. 
Note the stoichiometric equivalence of 1 mole of glucose is equivalent to 6 moles of carbon dioxide. Let's go over anaerobic respiration. Anaerobic respiration happens when there's a lack of oxygen gas. A lack of oxygen gas shuts down the electron transport chain. Since the ETC uses NADH and FADH2 to replenish NAD plus and FAD, the Krebs cycle will run out of NAD plus and FAD and also shut down. Likewise, glycolysis will run low on NAD plus. Not to mention on ATP because its earlier steps require ATP. The cell must somehow be able to replenish NAD plus and make some ATP. This is where anaerobic respiration comes in. Anaerobic respiration shunts pyruvate into alcoholic fermentation. So in glycolysis, glucose is converted into pyruvate. This uses NAD plus and produces ATP. Then, pyruvate is converted into ethanol, with the loss of CO2 and the use of NADH. This replenishes NAD+. So in sum, anaerobic respiration is 1 glucose into 2 ethanol plus 2 CO2 plus 2 ATP. Note the stoichiometric equivalence of 1 mole of glucose gives 2 mole of CO2. So now that we've talked about aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration, Let's talk about the actual experiment. In the experiment, the triiodomethane or iodoform test for alcohol was conducted to confirm the presence of alcohol in the anaerobic setup. This is a test for a specific type of alcohol called secondary methyl alcohol. And indeed, ethanol fits the bill. The test involves reacting ethanol with sodium hypoiodite, NaOI. This comes from the reaction between sodium hydroxide and iodine. The product is iodoform, and this causes the solution to change from brownish, the color of iodine, to orange or yellowish, the color of iodoform. The other product is methanoic acid. But anyway, the orange or yellowish color is a positive result, shown by the test tube on the right in image 1. Actually, just by observing the solutions without the test, we can determine that the beaker on the right in image 2 has ethanol because of its murky appearance. So now we can move on to the quantitative results. First, for the aerobic setup, we are indeed seeing a reduction in mass. And the reduction in mass is because the mass is lost as CO2 and water vapor and other gases. So, to differentiate the mass loss due to CO2 and due to H2O and others, we subtract the measurements of the control with no glucose, shown in blue, from that of experimental with glucose, shown in orange. We get the number of moles of CO2 released by dividing the differences by 12.01 grams per mole, the molar mass of carbon dioxide. For an aerobic setup, we are seeing an increase in volume of water displaced, which is the volume of CO2 produced. Again, we subtract measurements of control from experimental to differentiate volume change due to CO2 and due to H2O plus other gases. We get the number of moles of CO2 using the van der Waals law, which we can do using an online software. Having processed the data from the aerobic and anaerobic setups accordingly, we can now compare the two. Aerobic CO2 production is shown in blue, while anaerobic in orange. Based on the graph, aerobic gas production is greater than anaerobic gas production. Note that the difference keeps getting bigger. In fact, we have confirmed the implication of the stoichiometries for aerobic and anaerobic respiration. Remember, in aerobic, 1 glucose gives 6 CO2. In anaerobic, 1 glucose gives 2 CO2. We are interested in comparing the rates of reaction. The graph showing the change in millimoles of CO2 may already show that, but there's a more appropriate way to do it. We will base it on glucose, not on CO2, 
because the stoichiometric coefficients of CO2 in aerobic and anaerobic are different. For aerobic, we need to divide the millimoles of CO2 by 6 and by 2 for anaerobic. So the data are further processed to give the graph on the left. Glucose decomposition rates are shown to start off nearly equal for the first 25 minutes, after which they start to significantly differ. Aerobic glucose decomposition becomes increasingly faster. But the initial equality may be due to two reasons. There must have been some oxygen in the anaerobic setup which eventually got depleted, and most notably, this reflects how anaerobic yeasts later experience three things. One, lowered ATP due to the lack of oxidative phosphorylation. Two, deficiency of NAD plus and FAD in Krebs cycle, shutting it down. Three, deficiency of NAD plus in glycolysis, which severely slows down glucose breakdown. A linear regression gives a linear equation, wherein the slope represents the rate of glucose decomposition in millimoles per minute. For anaerobic, the estimate is 0.0056 millimoles per minute, while for aerobic, the estimate is 0.0083 millimoles per minute, greater than anaerobic. In this experiment, the carbohydrate metabolism of yeast was investigated by varying the presence of glucose and oxygen in the setups and by comparing their production of carbon dioxide. It was found that the yeast can produce carbon dioxide the fastest in the presence of glucose and oxygen. The stoichiometric and kinetic relationships were also investigated, showing that gas production, which translates to cellular respiration, both occurs faster in the presence of glucose, may it be an aerobic or anaerobic pathway. For future experiments, it is recommended to perform the experiment in the optimal temperature of the yeast if the effect of temperature will not be investigated. Moreover, the amount of yeast, reaction temperature, and even the carbohydrate sources such as disaccharide and oligosaccharides and their concentrations can be varied to investigate the optimal conditions and rate of respiration of yeast. Lastly, mixing two monosaccharides in one solution can also be done to investigate if the yeast would favor one over the other. Again, we are Group 5 presenting the article Aerobic and Anaerobic Respiration in Yeast. Thank you for listening and we are now ready for your questions.